company was very much culture first. Unfortunately, it wasn't, didn't have a strategy and, and performance ethic or execution capability to match that. And so my whole attitude coming in is, I don't want to change the cult, it's really good, but I want to bring the winning strategy and I want to bring the winning uh, talent and execution formula to match that. And if I were looking back over nine years, chronic market strategy, I'd give us high grades for. Uh, execution, we're good, good enough to IPO, good enough to be a profitable public company. Welcome to the e-commerce toolbox, Expert Perspectives, a podcast by Noivu where we explore the elite strategies and cutting edge insights with our expert guests. Get ready to propel your e-commerce business to the next level. Welcome to another episode of the e-commerce toolbox experts perspective. Joining us today uh, from Austin, Texas, we got Brent Bellum, who I'm assuming a lot of you folks know. He is the CEO of Big Commerce Top 3 Platform. Welcome, Brent. Thanks for having me, Kaylin. Excited to join you. I always like to kick it off with a, to learn a bit more about your journey. So obviously I did some research ahead of time, but I'm assuming you could tell it better than me. How did you end up being at the helm of big commerce for the last decade? What's your career journey? Uh, how, how did you go from call it McKinsey or Credit Suisse all the way to big com? Well, starting out of college, I knew I wanted a career in business, but didn't know which industry, which function. And so joined a management consulting firm to get exposure to a bunch of different industries. Walked into, in my third project, uh, serving one of the biggest retailers in the United States. Uh, it was Kmart, like in 1994, 30 years ago. And it wasn't just Kmart, it was all their specialty retailers. Sports Authority, Office Max, Walden, Books, Borders, Bookstores. I mean, they were in a lot of different categories and had category leaders. We're also getting into groceries with super centers, but having to survive in an era when Walmart and other big box retailers like Home Depot were kind of taking over. We had a really successful series of projects that kind of prolonged their life by a number of years. And I decided at that point in time, I liked retail. I liked consumer goods. That was what I wanted to do. When I went to business school a couple of years later and everybody else was getting all excited about venture capital or uh, startups or um, you know private equity and things like that, I still liked retail. The problem was that retail in 1995, six, seven was, you know, kind of a, a death march, you know, of survival against big box retailers. And then the internet changed everything. The internet really started to catch on around 97 as Amazon was growing, eBay was starting. Uh, by 98, my focus in consulting had switched to e-commerce consulting, not store-based retail. Uh, I did the first work ever for McKinsey on branded manufacturers selling direct to consumer, which only a couple like Nike had begun doing at that time for fear of channel conflict. Um, and then really the the key moment in my career progression to big commerce happened at the end of 99. I knew I didn't want to be a career consultant. I wanted to be on the team, not advising the team. I wanted to I had to get out of debt because I don't come from a wealthy family and a lot of school debt. But when I was out of debt at the end of 1999, high to the internet bubble, I had now the first chance in my career to say, okay, I know what my interests are. I want to do e-commerce. Um, if I'm going to bet my next job on one e-commerce model at the height of the internet bubble, didn't realize it was a bubble quite yet, uh, what, what company would I bet on? And the key thing here is I picked a company called Escalate, which was exactly like big commerce back from the 90s. It was one of the first ever SaaS e-commerce platforms, the ones that came out of the 90s. I can only think of four of them. There was Yahoo Stores, Volusion, Blue Martini, and Escalate. These are companies, they didn't call it SaaS back then, they call it ASP model. And But, but it was basically hosted stores, right? You don't have to buy license software. It's served up over, they didn't even call it the cloud back then, but that's what it was served up over. So I, I did that starting at the beginning of 2000 and... Um, wasn't there, I was only there for about a year and a half because, you know, for as great an idea as it was, it was kind of before its time. And in all fairness, the company did not execute as well as, you know, even arguably Volusion and Yahoo stores did. Um, Blue Martini also sort of uh, faded out pretty quickly. Uh, and then I went on and joined uh, eBay. So I started all over again. So if I'm going to bet the next couple of years of my career, what do I think is the best e-commerce business in early, mid 2001. And that was a pretty good bet for about two years. Uh, but the big, big thing that happened in my 
eBay time was uh, I joined as uh, into the strategy team. And within a couple of months, I was head of strategy at eBay. They asked me to kind of lead a project to evaluate whether eBay should compete in payments or buy PayPal. Because at the time, eBay was not a transactional website for most auction successes. Uh, recommended that they buy PayPal, which they then did. And upon the purchase of PayPal, I moved from eBay to PayPal and basically set in place the post acquisition strategy. Like all the things that you do on PayPal today, back then did not exist. The express checkout button did not exist. You know, we had to create that, design that, name that, fund that, launch that. I did all of that. And it was again, the wishes of eBay. You know, eBay didn't want PayPal to create payment solution for merchants off eBay, but it was kind of obvious that that's how you maximize the potential of PayPal. We did it anyway. Uh, pure credit card processing, which then became the acquisition of the VeriSign Gateway, which later became the acquisition of the Braintree uh, payment service provider. You know, that was all done during those first couple of years when I was head of strategy. Then I went to Europe and ran PayPal Europe for four years. Then I came back and ran global product. I'm getting to e-commerce because one of the last things that was happening uh, in my 10th year at PayPal, eBay, I'm running global product and there was this new platform. We, you know, we had to partner with all the e-com platforms. There was a new one called Magento that we saw rising from, sorry, I have my phone silenced, but my phone is linked to the computer and the computer's not silenced when the phone rings. Um, we saw it, we, we had to partner with all the e-com platforms. We saw the rise of Magento. It was a, it was a rocket ship, open source on-prem software. It was very clear that my boss wanted to buy Magento within the process of buying Magento, which then happened after I left in 2010. So five year interim, I left PayPal, uh, went to a travel company, but turned it into an e-commerce business, VRBO, HomeAway, couldn't do transactions, couldn't do bookings when I got there. Within a year, it's transactional. Today, it's probably 20 billion plus in annual bookings on VRBO and all the HomeAway properties. Uh, but when I got the job offer for in commerce and came in, the the very apparent thing to me was that we had grown, you know, under the founders 2009 to 2015 to be the second largest SaaS platform for SMBs. And I wanted and, and Shopify had a five year head start. I didn't think we could catch them. And so the key uh, concept we had was we're going to go up market. We're going to go after Magento. The world's businesses need a SaaS successor to open source. We call it open SaaS. And that's the background. It's a long story, but it tells you a lot about um, sort of the evolution of e-commerce and how SaaS under big commerce finally came to go after the mid-market and Magento. I love it. Maybe talk to us a bit about how big commerce has actually evolved under your leadership, approaching a decade here, like you mentioned, when you came in, um, it was heavily focused on SMB. I know you guys from really leading like the mid-market and then the enterprise, people that want to do composable or headless builds. Maybe, yeah, talk to us a bit about how Bitcom evolved under your leadership and how that's kind of shaped where it is today. Yeah, just a couple of key highlights here. One is the decision to move up market was made before day one, right? And so I walked in and I said, SMBs and Shopify are not our primary competition any longer. It's now Magento. But we have to transform our SMB platform into true med market and then later enterprise. And we did that, this open SaaS concept of taking the what you see is what you get monolith and decomposing it into microservices, you know, where every area of the product functionality is exposed via APIs for purposes of customization, extension, bypassing our functionality to give merchants the benefits of openness, flexibility, and agility that they used to have to have on-prem software to get, and now they could get from SaaS. And then we added enterprise functionality on top of it. So we're nine years plus later, and it's a true enterprise platform today with things like multi-storefront, multi-geography, full-featured B2B in addition to B2C, and full composability. Uh, I would say that, like I did last week at our summit, there are five things that we want to be the best in the world at. Um, you know, the core is enterprise B2C functionality. Uh, we're now very strong in B2B as well. I think we're the best in the world at mid-market B2B and knocking on the doors of enterprise. Uh, omni-channel is a massive priority for us, meaning enabling businesses to optimize their success through the third-party ad channels and marketplaces that they either get traffic from or sell through. We bought a business called Feedonomics three years ago. It's the clear global leader for enterprises 
doing omni-channel advertising and marketplace selling. So omni-channel is the third thing we want to be the global leader at. The fourth is composability. And oftentimes, you know, remember the Mock Alliance, people think of us in commerce tools as the top two composable platforms. And then uh, the fifth is multi-geographic and international selling. Those are the five things we really focus on and have built out, you know, I think a very strong, if not leadership position over the last nine years. When you joined the business nine years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was HQ in Australia. It was heavily founder led in the SMB space. How were you able to pivot not only the culture, well, so maybe not pivot business towards mid-market and enterprise and then maintain the culture of innovation all while moving HQs to a 24-hour flight away? Yeah, well, I didn't have to move the headquarters. That uh, The business was founded in Australia in 2009, you're correct there. But the founders moved the headquarters to the US, Austin, Texas specifically, two years later in 2011, because the business was taking off in the US, like 80% of their customers were North America. They realized they had to get closer to the customer, closer to the market opportunity. That was their vision. And it was a good four years after that, when the founders said, let's turn, hand over the reins to somebody else. They had not moved to the US, so they were trying to run a US company from Sydney. That wasn't working, it had gotten to a size that was well beyond what they had run before, but just a fraction of, you know, a 10th to a 20th the size of, of businesses that I had run. Uh, and so they they were just great. I mean, they were so supportive of me. I'm actually gonna be having dinner with one of the founders in a couple of weeks in Sydney, which we do periodically. Uh, wonderful set of relationships. The culture side of things, what I would mention is when I came in, in 2015, our CFO, Robert Alvarez, He's a CFO, but the best cultural leader I've ever worked with. Just an extraordinary human being. Company was very much culture first. Unfortunately, it wasn't, didn't have a strategy and, and performance ethic or execution capability to match that. And so my whole attitude coming in is, I don't want to change the cult. It's really good, but I want to bring the winning strategy and I want to bring the winning uh, talent and execution formula to match that. And, you know, I think... If I were looking back over nine years, product market strategy, I'd give us high grades for uh, execution. We're good, good enough to IPO, good enough to be a profitable public company. Um, I think under new, uh, my new president, Travis Hell, and some of the leaders we're bringing in and some of the changes we're making, we can go to truly great on the execution side too. It's really, you know, my aspiration to turn the world of e-commerce into a two horse race. There's no question that Shopify is one of the two horses, but I want the commerce to be the enterprise winning horse. They may be a bigger horse and a prettier horse. We're going to be a faster horse and we're going to help enterprise businesses, whether B2C or B2B, uh, thrive online. That's our focus and, and where, you know, I really want us to be the big winner in the next five, 10 years. I love the clear focus and the vision. And I think it brought a lot of clarity being at the summit last week as well. Um, what were some of the unique challenges going from a customer base that was primarily SMB towards mid-market and effectively now enterprise? And even in our own journey, going up market, SOC 2, this, this, all these other things, roles, permissions, I'm just naming random features, but effectively, like, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you could recall on uh, actually achieving up market towards from at SMB to mid-market and then eventually enterprise? Gosh, everything. And, and it's only nine years into it. Are we finally making the, 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 the remaining final changes? I would say one of the biggest things that I've learned later than I wish I had is when I came in, we were still a mass market business and I had sales marketing services, all individually reporting up into me as CEO. That's what it had been at my prior two companies, which again, were 10 to 20 times bigger uh, than was big commerce when I joined. That's not the right model in enterprise software. In enterprise software, companies will have a president or a chief revenue officer where all the customer facing functions of marketing, sales, service, report into that individual. Um, because there's a kind of a unified motion to how you market to them, sell them, serve them, grow them. Right. Because it's not like, oh, once they're sold, you toss them over the fence to services and then you just serve them. We're serving enterprises. So enterprises have lots of brands, lots of geographies, lots of segments they sell into, lots of needs beyond just basic e-commerce. And 
there's endless opportunities to help them succeed in all of those other areas if you have the right service model. Well, we didn't we didn't hire our first president until last year. Uh, and I think Travis is really bringing all of this together in a way that the market will really appreciate. They're going to see from us better positioning, uh, better implementation. I mean, really world class in those areas, uh, which is what we need to be to serve the biggest companies in the world. When you're serving Procter and Gamble or GE appliances or you know many of the giant brands we serve in a lot of different categories, um, you've got to be buttoned up across the entire thing. And uh, I, I now realize kind of belatedly, we should have gone to that model ahead of the curve rather than behind the curve. Our product got to enterprise before our full go-to-market marketing, sales, and service model did. Uh, so that's one of the biggest changes. And then how you operate as a company, meaning your revenue operation, sales ops, marketing ops, service ops, that all has to be instrumented toward that model rather than a model that is a mass market um, model. Lots of other changes, but I think that's the single biggest aha for me. And, and any other company who starts in classic disruptive technology fashion. Actually, I'm curious, if Clay, Clay Christensen, who coined the term, were still around, uh, I'd love to have a conversation with him about how much of his research focused on the actual organizational shift, because he focused on disruptive technology. And his definition of disruptive technology was always tech that was cheaper, faster, and easier, and built for the underserved low end of the market. So anytime you hear that term, disruptive tech, the textbook definition from Clay Christensen means, by definition, it initially started not disrupting anybody. It was actually serving the low end of the market that the market leaders didn't care for because they couldn't make money off. But then the disruptive tech, cheaper, faster, easier, build breadth and depth at the low end of the market. And it only becomes disruptive if and when it decides to add features and functionality to then go after the mainstream and go to the mainstream and say, hey, mainstream of the market, I only have 80% of what the market leader has, but I have the 80% you want, it costs 80% less. That's when, the, that's when the market leader, you know, think in the past of e-commerce, Magento, Oracle ATG, Salesforce, IBM SAP, that's when they get disrupted. When somebody like us comes in and says, they may have a few more bells and whistles, but we have everything that's most essential to you and it costs 80% less. It's better tech, higher performing, easier to use. That's disruption. That's what the tech does. But my question is, did Clay write and study very much the organizational change? Because what I've experienced was uh, as CEO, I was better at leading the technology transformation, the product transformation, the market strategy transformation, uh, than I was the organizational transformation. Because that model, for example, of having a go-to-market leader, a president, uh, where all the enterprise motions get unified, is just different for enterprise than it is for mass market or SMB. And I was, uh, you know, we're, we're now finally getting that right. And I think that's the final piece in the puzzle for us to uh, go from being a very good company, profitable public, to a truly great company and market leader in enterprise. I I heard I first heard the term open SaaS uh, from effectively you guys and your marketing material. How do you see the this philosophy of open SaaS different from your competitors? Um, how do you guys think about balancing flexibility, customization with call it simplicity of 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 deployment? So yeah, curious to to hear about your philosophy and how you think that positions you guys to to market lead here. There's a technical answer and a business answer. The technical answer is open SaaS is meant to make SaaS as open and flexible as possible in competition with open source. You know, open source Magento or any, you know, licensed software, you own the code. You can change the code, extend the code, modify the code. Um, with SaaS, that can only happen when there are APIs and the APIs uh, enable or limit what a third party, a customer, an agency, a tech uh, partner can do with and on top of the platform. So the whole point technically of open SaaS was opening up every component of it so that it could become as flexible as possible in competition with the alternative, which is you license your software, uh, whether it's open source or, or packaged and go from there. From a business model perspective, this is a, and so that's a big difference between us and all the legacy uh, leaders, which are nowhere near as open. Um, most of them were on-prem software, IBM, Oracle, SAP, Magento. 
or if they were SaaS, like uh, Demandware. Demandware was somewhat open, but nowhere near as open as we are. A big difference, though, uh, as well, is on the business side, whether you have the mindset of a conglomerate trying to assemble a one-size-fits-all suite of integrated solutions, or instead be best of breed, meaning be the very best e-com platform in the world, but not try to have and shove own and shove down the throats of every merchant, a proprietary order management system, proprietary payments, proprietary point of sale, proprietary um, ERP, proprietary shipping and fulfillment. And I say that provocatively because all of our enterprise competitors are suites. Their strategy is to sell a customer a whole bunch of things, none of which may individually be best for their business, but then they try to argue it works well in combination. So, you know, that's the biggest difference between us and Shopify. Shopify gets 70% of their revenue, not from their e-com platform, but from proprietary payments, proprietary point of sale, proprietary lending, proprietary, you know, on down, they even try to get into shipping and fulfillment and warehousing. Um, in the enterprise market, I think that that model in fairness to them, is ideal for entrepreneurs and startups who can fit into, if not a box, a swim lane, right? And execute that swim lane. But most enterprises are complex. They have a pre-existing uh, point of sale in their stores. They have pre-existing payment relationships, or they're in a country where one is, you know, there, there's no one size fits all. I know that better than anybody. I know payments like the back of my hand. There's no one size fits all perfect solution for every business and every category and every size, every geography around the world. And so I think that our strategy of all of our attention going into building the most open, agile, easy to use and powerful SaaS platform in the world, and then integrating with the best third party payment solutions, point of sales, uh, what Noibu does, that is, that is our open SaaS strategy to be best of breed. And it's distinctive. All of our major enterprise competitors, other than commerce tools, which is pure microservices, uh, other than the, you know, other than the real mock players, uh, they're all suites, they're all conglomerates. And I don't think they have the merchant's best interests at heart if they're large and complex. We'll let you use the best solution for everything. And that's why, for example, if you look at like we've done in checkout, our checkout is the best in the market, despite what a competitor claims. It converts at 70% across all enterprise customers using any of our three flagship payment partners, PayPal, Stripe, or Adya. It is far above industry averages, far above the competition. Our average site conversion for enterprise customers is 2.67% in the second half of last year, way above the internet average. And I think that is happening because we're giving best of breed to our customers who optimize their whole customer experience based on their needs. That's the advantage of open SaaS. It's not the best approach for everybody, you know, small businesses might like an all-in-one suite. Some enterprises might like an all-in-one Salesforce or SAP. Uh, but when you want to have the most agile and best of breed, customized technology stack for your complex business, that's where I think we're advantaged. Partner strategy sounds like it's pretty critical to be able to execute against this uh, strategy that you've outlined. Best of breed, know your swim lane build really, really deep. How do you look at your partner strategy? How have you had to be intentional there uh, to kind of fulfill that vision? Yeah, it's our goal to be open and have the best integration with the best solution providers, I say plural, in every category and innovate with them, right? And a, an example is I'll just give checkout and payments. So if Shopify has a proprietary payment solution, well, we get to go work with all of the best players in the world, like PayPal, like Stripe, like Adyen, like many, many, many others. Uh, you know, a lot of others. It's, it's, it's you know, Blue Snap, World Pay, Global Pay, Checkout.com. You know, so many around the world, and we innovate with them. We're the first platform to bring Fastlane by PayPal, which I think is a lot better than Shop Pay. They have four times the network recognition. We might have been the first one to have Stripe Link, which is Stripe's version of passwordless. Uh, one-click guest checkout. Um, so many innovations that we do with our partners in shipping, in point of sale, and what we're doing with Noibu, I'm really excited about. I mean, I love the story of what we're doing together. We found out about you through a customer who is using you. And a customer comes to us and says, we're getting indications from Noibu that 0.1% of the time there is drop-off in the checkout, and we think it's your fault, big commerce. And, you know, our response was, well, we actually think it's your integration. You've got a customized version of the checkout. But they, but no, they pointed us to your 
instrumentation. You proved it to us that it was like a very edge case bug or not bug, but uh, something that we had to account for. And we fixed that and we realized, wow, wouldn't it be powerful if a lot more of our customers were using Noibu and we made it really easy for them to get instrumented and integrated with Noibu really at the time of launch, because it's at the time of launch where you want to iron out and eliminate any drop off in the customer experience flow. Um, I don't know how many joint customers we have now, but we're frequently recommending you because not only do you make our customer sites better, but our customers come back and stop blaming us for things that are uh, issues on their side. But they do then coin us with proof to, you know, here's something that commerce you can do to improve whatever it is, latency in this spot, drop off in this spot. Um, and so it's that type of innovation and it's unconventional, like how we're working with you as a platform. I bet you would say no other platform is working with you because we see the benefit of your solution. We see it working for merchants. We realize a lot of merchants would be better off with that. And we don't just stop there. We try to say, how would one plus one equal three? You know, uh, how, how is it that we could enable more merchants to benefit from what you do, which we then benefit from too? Um, so I, what we do with Noibu is a great example of how we work in every other category to try to innovate and bring more value to our customers than any other platform would. Yeah, I think you're you're bang on with that. One of the key challenges that mid-market and enterprise retailers have is they take the foundation and then they effectively customize a lot on top of it. And we've seen from our data with you guys that uh, 99.6 plus percent of the bugs that we are kind of observing or any latency things are are related to customizations that the merchants do themselves. And in very rare cases, uh, there could be things, and you guys have been amazing on jumping on that. And I could say that as of today, you guys are the only platform that are analyzing cross customers and looking for ways to actually improve your core platform. So I think that's that's well, a, that's, that's definitely that's a big strength. Is, yeah, that to me, though, that statistic is why you're so valuable. Imagine if you're my service people who really care about customers. And 99.6% of the time, a customer comes and says, we have an issue. Uh, we think it might be you, Big Commerce. Can you help us uh, debug it and solve that issue? And 99.6% of the time, they're wrong, assuming they came to us with every one. And it's actually on their side, right? And we shouldn't be in the business of being their agency or professional services firm debugging their implementation. But when it is on our side, we want to know that. And there's no better way to get to that answer quickly. Avoid the escalations to us when it's on their side, 99.6% of the time, and focus on the 0.4 when it really is us. We can get a lot more of that 0.4% resolved if we're not distracted by the other 99.6. And so it's just incredibly valuable uh, to our customers and my services team so that we focus on the things that are really within our control and fix those. Makes sense. We took a bit of a, we took a bit of a right lane turn there, but I'm, uh, I'm really curious to learn a bit about, we hear a lot about big comms ability for multi storefront. How big of an impact has that had on, on your customer base in your own words? Uh, it's enormous. I think multi storefront capabilities, which is, you know, in short, the ability to have a single master account, but different storefronts for different brands and or different geographies and or different use cases like B2B and B2C, all leveraging common infrastructure where desired. Like you can use the same or different payment processors. You can use the same or different currencies, same or different shipping, same or different design, but all under one account rather than having to create an entirely redundant and separate store counting, user experience, integration, et cetera, for every single storefront. That's the single biggest differentiator between a true enterprise platform like us and an SMB or non-enterprise platform uh, like others I won't name. For us to build that, it took four or five years because we built that on a multi-tenant SaaS platform that never stopped operating for our customers. Our customers didn't have to, like they did with Magento once upon a time, upgrade from Magento 1.x to Magento 2. It was just suddenly, when available, a new feature, right? You're running on a whatever uh, $80 a month plan, hundred you know $100 a month plan, and you now have the ability to add more storefronts without ever having break in or broken what you had or having diversion. Uh, and, and so what we're seeing is this helps us unbelievably with bigger, more complex businesses that do have 
multiple brands, do sell in different geographies, uh, are doing B2B and B2C, where we're particularly strong in functionality in both areas. Uh, so it's just core to our growth and our ability to kind of achieve that vision of being the modern enterprise e-commerce leader. Love it. And as we look to to cap this off, what are some of the most compelling use cases for a composable or headless storefront that you've seen in kind of the mid-market and enterprise space? Boy, I could give you so many examples, but the thing I want to really emphasize on composable, uh, it's, it's going to be a slightly different answer than the question you asked, but I think it's the most important thing to get out as time is running out. Historically, composable meant headless. You know, we've been doing uh, headless since 2016. Headless, headless simply means the front end storefront or customer experience is created and managed in a different set of technologies than the core platform. So if you're a hosted platform like us, we can host the whole front end. We give you a theme, we give you a page builder to modify the theme. You've got theme files, a CLI, you can go in and modify the theme. That is the traditional model of a SaaS platform which is it's hosting your store. Headless, on the other hand, says, I don't want to use big commerce or a Shopify theme or whatever. I want to use a WordPress front end. I want to use Drupal. I want to use, you know, a CMS like Contentful or Content Stack or Ampliance. Um, and you start not just managing the front end that way, but maybe you're composing in a specific uh, search and merch solution. Um, you're using a specific host that you want to use. That is the model. And after eight years of doing headless, we're a real leader there, second platform in the mock alliance. We've come to the point of view that we can make it easier, a lot easier and better to do composable and headless than having to each merchant or each agency compose the whole architecture for each merchant. Uh, also have available reference architecture. Um, we call ours Catalyst. It's based on Next.js and React, which are the two most popular front-end frameworks in the world today. You can press a button, within 60 seconds, have a completely fully configured Big Commerce composable and headless store. Uh, you can put it on the host of your choice out of the box. We'll give you Vercel, the creator. You know, Guillermo is the creator of Next.js. Next.js is built for Vercel and vice versa. Uh, that works spectacularly well, but you can host somewhere else too. Um, you can use either our native search or any of our search partners like Algolia. You can use uh, pre-integrated any of the leading CMSs, again, like Contentful, Content Stack, Ambience, out of the out of the box, 100 Google Lighthouse scores across the board, speed, accessibility, image rendering, SEO, uh, an open source React component library. And the kind of coup de grace on all of this is we bought the world's best visual editor, no or low code visual editor for Next.js websites called MakeSwift. And we demoed that last week so that business users can now be managing uh, pages, layout, content without developer dependencies, uh, which gives true agility, not just to the technical users who have to work in Next.js and React, but the business users who get to use MakeSwift. Um, what's so different, though, about the approach we're about to use, aside from just having a reference architecture press a button out of the box, is that we'll also create a hosted version of this. Uh, and so it will be the first time ever that you can get composability out of the box. You can go from our hosted version to an upgraded Vercel or someone else hosting. Um, and so it's going to be seamless. It's going to be the future of storefront on Big Commerce will be Next.js React, uh, make Swift for editing uh, if it's hosted. And then if it's not hosted, if it's headless, you can you can choose to use Catalyst and make Swift with a press of a button, or you can use any of our other partners on the front end, but they're getting access to all the same upgraded APIs that power Catalyst. So I think this approach, which so many agencies are saying, this is a dream come true. We want to be working in Next.js and React. It's the best set of front end tech in the world. Uh, they're telling us that our approach to delivering it to them is a generation move forward, right? It is the future where we're really uh, doing what they most want in most cases. And uh, so I'm a big believer that going forward, the choice between composable or not composable won't be a choice on big commerce, right? Everybody is composable. There's a choice between whether you're headless or not. Headless meaning am I hosting it somewhere else or letting big commerce host us? Uh, but you're always able to compose. You can use all out of the box functionality or you can you know, switch to third-party content, third-party search and merge, right? Third-party hosting. 
that that really is where we're going. And I think it is the most important, you know, technical and product innovation on our side since open SaaS. And I'm hoping that for the next 10 plus years, it's the most important and valuable in the platform industry. It's going to deliver true agility, not just to technical users, but also business users. Um, and that's a big, that's a big thing we're doing right now. I love it. Brent, as we look to wrap up, thank you so much for your time. This is, um, I think this is one of the most insightful podcasts I've done. This is definitely the longest with the best content in a, in a very long time. So thank you so much for your time and uh, looking forward to putting this out there. Great. Thanks, Galen. Enjoyed it. The e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives is brought to you by Noibu. To find out more about Noibu and how we can help you debug your e-commerce site and rocket your revenue, visit www.noibu.com. That's N-O-I-B-U dot com. And then make sure to search for the e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Noibu, thanks for listening.